Good morning, Delusia. Any calls for me yet? Morning, Russ. Thank you. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ladies. Some say this is the worst pain I've had in my whole life without any real physical signs of pain, so it can be really tough. We have a complex job in assessing that. Sometimes I could have a patient sitting there saying they're hurting 10 out of 10, and yet they're sitting there like you or I. Just begins to ache, okay. even with the tablets. It's not clear to me why he is the way he is. Um, this catastrophic pain and what he is telling himself about it. But there always is a little bit of concern. Am I being manipulated? Is this really real? You don't always know how to verify their complaints. You feel somewhat exploited. It is a very unpleasant feeling. Sometimes we say, oh, she's coming with back pain, but I don't think that she's really in pain. But really, even if someone's in pain or distress, it doesn't have to be in how they present themselves. That doesn't mean that she's not in pain. I used to be one of those people that used to say, oh, well, they probably just want attention. People are in pain. Pain is, is so subjective, and that's where the difficulty lies. I find it hard to say how one person's pain can be judged by somebody else. You have to show the patient you're empathetic towards them. There is a pain. Pain is real. OK, so stop off at reception, make another appointment, and I'll see you again next week. Thanks very much. Being able to track something gives me more comfort than going by what they're telling me, because I like to see proof. You need to be convinced that you're treating something and that what you're treating is real. I'll listen to their story, I'll examine them, but I always say, you've got to exclude the physical first. That's your job. I feel we have an obligation to exclude the physical before jumping into psychosocial explanations, because that reduces the patient to an unnecessary complainer. And I don't really believe that they are. So, obviously, it was probably about six months ago now um, since I last saw you, um, and it's it's not really been getting any better. Um, it's It's got quite a bit worse over the last week. Um, the terminology, psychiatric and psychological, have a stigma attached to them that's not intended. We accept that patients with long-term pain will have a psychological component to it, but actually labelling it as that. It's a subtlety. If you present the explanation for pain as completely airy-fairy, psychological, that's up to you. Then they're going to go away dissatisfied. So you've got to lead them in gently. If you start from the body, then it's not threatening and you can approach things through the body. The fact that you tell them that there's something wrong physically, just that gives you a certain sense of relief. If there isn't a physiological problem, then it doesn't mean that there isn't an illness. And if the patient is suffering, then we need to look at that and how we can help. You focus straight away on a biological type approach to it. Sometimes the psychological feelings get more brushed over, perhaps. There's not enough space in the consultation. Uh, can I make an appointment, please? Yes, sir. What name is it? Helen Thomas. Helen Thomas. I recognise that we're trying to promote learning by giving choice and allowing people to get it wrong. We learn by doing, not by being told what to do. I get that. But it is very difficult not to give advice when I can see that that advice could be really helpful. Uh, trying to uh, allow myself to listen objectively and to sit with the fact that actually the, the patient might want to do something wholly unsensible, yet allowing that to happen if that truly is what they want. Patients have to embrace our suggestion because they think it's the right one, not because we want them to follow a particular option. If we propose something that's inconsistent with their knowledge or experience, then they're just not going to listen to you. People feel let down by their doctors. The satisfaction rate is very low. 
basically because we don't solve their problem. I think it's important for them to take ownership. But often, as soon as they feel a little uncomfortable, they'll shift to a different prescriber. And I honestly think it's like a ship without a rudder. And it's going round and round in circles. Okay, well, you know, I need that as soon as you can because I'm in, you know, a lot of pain here. Yeah, no, I completely understand. We want you to carry on. We kept having a difference of opinion. Fairly soon, but I said, we think that your back isn't damaged. He said he can't understand that. There have definitely been times where I've done what they've asked, just purely because it became so antagonistic in the consultation. That's what I've done. One becomes more stable as a person over time, and you no longer believe that you can do everything, that you're able to solve everything. Young doctors can have that, that belief that they, they can solve everything. Treatment has to be tailored to the patient's needs. Prescriptive guidelines promoting one-size-fits-all is not acceptable. If you work according to the guidelines, you are constrained in your performance. What would be left of your independence, your own competence, your own practical experience? I mean, it's a dual role for us. Um, obviously, we're responsible for the patient's health, uh, but the second role that we have is one of gatekeeper, and the two sometimes don't sit very comfortably. And it all lands on our doorstep. It's not only we who face the system, we act as mediators between the patient and the system. Um, not only do we work with the patient against the system, but we have to work with the system as well. Every time I send somebody to a new healthcare professional in the hospital, they come out with more medications or injections. Often I find they're not accomplishing any more than I was. It's very frustrating. If they weren't an easy patient, I wouldn't have referred them, and they wouldn't be seeing them. Yeah, we get a lot of mileage out of slapping each other on the back a little bit and increasing the other members of the team's confidence and by respecting the other members of the team, um, their profile is improved. I think there should be no hierarchy within the team. Yeah, and if the team sort of echoes the same message and provides richness in terms of their different perspective on it, then I think there is less confusion for the poor patients and they're able to follow through on a unified evidence-based recommendation. You forget how much chronic pain affects the patient. I mean, they lose their job, they get emotional distress and depression. They need compassion and understanding and can't give them that in a pill. You become a doctor not to tell people, I can't do anything, I can't find anything. And you have this perception of yourself as well, that you're going to figure it out. And when you can't figure it out, it's frustrating. I try to listen to the patient, sort of empathise, trying to see where the patient is coming from, um, but not letting it get too personal. Um, I've used the phrase detached empathy. I see the consultation as a journey rather than this is my one chance and I have to get it all done in one go. Then you both have a more realistic expectation of where things are going to take you. It's about moving away from that stuckness and creating a little bit of momentum. Um, you know when you push a car, it's the first movement that's the hardest one, and then it builds. All right, see you tomorrow, guys.